Two masked men wheel a tea chest down a dark cobblestone street in the city of Edinburgh, Scotland. Inside the chest is the body of a dead man. The corpse is fresh, which means the two guys will get a tidy sum of cash for it. The man who hands them the money is a renowned anatomist at a leading medical training school. He knows what he's doing isn't exactly ethical, but in the name of medical science, he's prepared to bend a few rules. What he doesn't know is the two guys aren't merely body snatchers, they are cold-hearted killers. Before we come back to those two fiends, let us first explain to you why a globally recognized scientist would be buying dead bodies from criminals. In Britain in the 18th century, people could be executed for what might now seem like petty trivial things. For example, under the Waltham Black Act of 1723, a person who was found to have purposefully blackened their face could be sentenced to death. That's because the government thought poaching was becoming a big problem, and the poachers sometimes tried to evade being spotted by putting black stuff on their faces. After these new laws were introduced, a person could also be executed for fishing, destroying a fish pond or some trees, and even setting fire to some hay. These kinds of tough-on-crime measures became known as part of the Bloody Code, and by the time the 19th century rolled around, a person could be put to death for a whopping 220 different offenses, including petty theft if the value of the goods was high enough. With the Murder Act of 1752 introduced, there were quite a few executions every year. What this law meant was that someone convicted of murder could be sentenced to death, and also what was called punitive dissection, meaning their bodies could by law be opened up after death by medical experts who worked in the growing discipline of anatomy. According to historians, once that person had been hanged, medical students would stand around at the bottom of the gallows, arguing over who had the right to take the body. Bodies were in huge demand, but even with the strict laws, there just weren't enough of them. The problem was made worse in the 19th century because fewer people were being handed the death sentence. This was mostly a result of the Death Act of 1823, which made it so judges could pass lesser sentences than death for various crimes. It didn't bode well for the anatomists, who even though they were making breakthroughs in surgery, didn't have enough bodies to work on. The government wasn't serving up enough quality cadavers, and that led to some enterprising people stealing bodies. These people were known as resurrectionists or body snatchers. In the middle of the night, they'd turn up at graveyards to dig up the recently deceased. They'd then deliver the body to the medical school and collect their payment. The public didn't like knowing their deceased loved one might be taken and subsequently cut to pieces on a cold slab, so they did what they could to protect the grave. That meant sometimes hiring guards for the burial site if they had the money to do so, or or for less cash, hiring a huge slab that could be placed over the grave until the body was decomposed enough to not be of any use to the anatomists. The size of this problem can't be understated. One body snatching outfit alone, known as the London Burkers, admitted in 1831 to robbing and selling in the region of 1,000 bodies. The money was good, too, with the corpse generally fetching around 10 pounds once delivered to the medical school. Looking at currency calculators, that meant a body was worth about 1,000 pounds in today's money. That's about $1,400. The price for a body sometimes depended on the season. Bodies in winter paid more because they were generally less decomposed. There were enough people willing to take the risk of stealing bodies with that amount of money involved, and there was always enough anatomists willing to turn a blind eye to crime. But with the public getting so good at protecting gravesites, a crisis occurred. That crisis was felt in the city of Edinburgh, which was one of the most pioneering places on the planet when it came to the study of anatomy. One of the leading anatomists was Robert Knox, a man who regularly wooed hundreds of medical students when he lectured on anatomy at the Royal College of Surgeons. Almost every day he dissected bodies in front of a crowd of students, and that work led to some amount of fame, as well as progress in the field of anatomy. As we said though, there just weren't enough corpses for this groundbreaking work. And that's how Knox got to know two guys named William Burke and William Hare. These were two industrious young lads who both came from the tough streets of Ireland and later moved to Scotland. They would also become known as serial killers. There's a little rhyme that Scottish people would sometimes recite after the two were caught. Up the clothes and doon the stair, button Ben with Burke and Hare. Burke's the butcher, Hare's the thief, Knox the boy that buys the beef. They became friends in 1827 after Burke had moved into the lodging house that Hare owned with his lover, Margaret Laird, also known as Margaret Hare, even though they weren't legally married. It's likely the two men had previously met while working on the Union Canal. They drank a lot, and they got a bit of a reputation for being wayward. This is how one historian described Hare, illiterate and uncouth, a lean, quarrelsome, violent, and amoral character with the scars from old wounds about his head and brow. That same year they both met, an army pensioner named Donald died in the lodging house. It was a bad time to go, for Hare at least. 
McDonald owed him quite a bit of back rent, so over a bottle of whiskey, Burke and Hare discussed the possibility of selling Donald's body to the medical school. They then bought a coffin and filled it with bark, after which it was taken to the graveyard for burial. They took the body to Edinburgh University where they had heard they'd be able to find a buyer. At first they asked for Alexander Monroe, someone who was said to be the rival of Mr. Knox, although history tells us he wasn't half as talented. It was a student that told the guys to head over to Surgeon Square where they'd find Knox. They did just that and they were paid seven pounds, ten shillings for the corpse. Hare took a little bit more of the bounty to cover what he'd lost on the dead man's rent. On the way out, one of Knox's assistants said, we'd be glad to see you again when you have another to dispose of. This was some windfall for the two guys and they knew there and then that they could make a lot more money. All they needed was bodies, but as you know, graves were already very hard to rob since families had started taking security seriously. They got their chance to supply Knox with another body when a man staying at the lodging house became ill. His name was Joseph, and while he wasn't deathly ill, he soon looked that way after Hare and Burke plied him with enough whiskey to make an elephant stumble. They then suffocated the poor drunken man by holding a pillow over his nose and mouth. Their method of killing worked out well for them because it looked as though the deceased might have passed away from natural causes. Since the man had already been somewhat sick, his death didn't raise any suspicions. In fact, experts later wrote that the murder would have been practically undetectable. They received 10 pounds for the corpse. This is how the pair would kill other people, a method that would end up coming to be known as burking. That's how the guys in England got the name London Burkers because they robbed graves and also murdered people. Historians don't agree about who died next at the hands of Heron Burke. It could have been an elderly woman named Abigail Simpson, or it could have been a guy from England who was up in Scotland selling matches when he got a case of jaundice. It seems again the pair took advantage of the sick man and they saw an opportunity. Burke lay on the man's body while Hare suffocated him, this time with his hands. Yet again, the guys turned up where Knox worked and collected their cash. As for Simpson, she being elderly was easy prey. She was a frail pensioner who was in Edinburgh trying to raise some cash by selling salt. On February 12, 1828, she made the fatal mistake of agreeing to go back to the lodging house with the pair after which they plied her with copious amounts of whiskey. She was subsequently burked. They then hid the body in a tea chest and took it to Knox, who it seems was very happy about its fresh state. Burke would later say, Dr. Knox approved of it being so fresh, but he did not ask any questions. This was the thing with some doctors, they turned a blind eye to people breaking the law in the name of medical science, although it should be noted that Knox had no idea he was collecting murdered people. Soon after the murder of Simpson, Margaret Hare lured another woman into the house and gave her non-stop glasses of whiskey, after which Mr. Hare came home and killed her as she was passed out. That was another 10 pounds on the bank. Just weeks later, Burke was out in the city when he met two women by the names of Mary Patterson and Janet Brown. They drank heavily in the tavern and then went back to Burke's brother's house for more whiskey. Burke's wife then turned up and a fight broke out after she accused him of having intimate relations with Brown. At this point, Patterson was passed out drunk. Brown left soon after. Burke's wife left and went to get Hare, who turned up at the house with Margaret. The two men then locked their wives in one room and killed Patterson in another room. They took her body straight to Knox, which prompted one of Knox's assistants to ask how they'd gotten hold of a corpse that was still warm. The two men said they'd bought it from an old woman and that the deceased had drunk herself to death, which seemed believable given the smell of whiskey that emanated from her. Knox didn't mind. It was said that he was over the moon about getting such an excellent cadaver. He stored it in a vat of whiskey and dissected it three months later. The next victim was was an old woman named Mrs. Haldane. Yet again, she was plied with whiskey and the deed was done when she was barely conscious. Believe it or not, that woman's daughter later stayed at the lodgings and she was also murdered and then sold for 10 pounds. A woman named Effie was next. She was something of a scavenger and knew Burke from selling him bits of old leather she'd found in people's trash. Not too long after, she was dead and on Knox's slab. Burke was walking in the street when he saw a policeman trying to help a drunk woman who couldn't walk right. Burke kindly offered to help, telling the cop he'd take care of her. He did. But in the way he'd taken care of other women. The next murders were unique in that they were a double slaying. They killed a grandmother and her grandson while they were staying at the lodging house. They killed the woman in an upstairs bedroom and then they went down for the boy. Burke later said he always felt haunted by the expression on the boy's face just before they killed him. The two people couldn't fit in the tea chest, so this time they used a herring barrel to take the bodies to Surgeon Square. That was too big for the horse, which refused to move. They managed to flag down a cart and hitch a ride with that, but the poor horse was later shot by Hare. Knox 
paid them eight pounds for each corpse. As often happens in criminal enterprises, the two men later fell out. Burke had been out of town for a while, and when he returned he discovered Hare looking like he'd just come into money. Burke accused Hare of selling bodies behind his back, which Hare denied. A quick trip to see Dr. Knox proved to Burke that Hare had indeed done a bit of moonlighting, and the two got into a fistfight. Burke moved out of the lodging house after that, but the two men soon made up and started killing again. On a trip to visit Burke at his house, the two had some drinks when the washerwoman Miss Ostler turned up. The men gave each other a knowing look and proceeded to murder her. She was sold for eight pounds. Not long after, Burke's wife's relative, Anne Dougal, came to stay. It wasn't the best of trips for her. She was worth ten pounds. The next victim was much more a handful. He was an 18-year-old boy named James Wilson who had deformed feet and some mental issues. He lived on the streets and begged and was fondly known to people as Daft Jamie. Hare and Burke met Jamie on the street and told him there was free food and whiskey back at the lodging house. This kid was strong and he could handle his booze. Plus, he preferred snuff to the drink. Hare and Burke did eventually manage to kill the boy, but not without incurring some cuts and bruises. Thing was, Jamie was well known in the city. When the men delivered the body, Knox gladly paid them the cash, but some of the students said they knew the kid and he was alive and well not long ago. Seeing a threat on the horizon, Knox cut off his head and feet. He then dissected the body, even though he had other on the list to do before him. Knox was acting like a guilty man, but he wasn't going to give up paying those very reliable men. Burke then met a woman named Margaret Doherty. Since he was born and raised in Ireland, he used this to get on the good side of Mrs. Doherty, who was also from Ireland. It didn't take long for him to convince her to go to his place for some drinks. Hare also came around, as did the two wives, and merriment ensued over hours of many, many drinks. That was the downfall of Mrs. Doherty. They killed her and hid the body in some straw. That worked out badly for the killer because the next day some lodgers also stayed at the house and discovered the body of Doherty and noticed that she had been beaten up. They went straight to the cops, but by the time they arrived at the house, Hare and Burke had already sold the body to Knox. Still, the police found blood-stained sheets at the house. Then they went to Knox's place and found Doherty's body on a dissection table. The lodgers confirmed that it was her they found at the house. Burke and Hare were subsequently brought in for questioning, as were their wives. They all told different stories as to what happened, but in the end, the men were charged with murder. As for Knox, it was ruled that he hadn't broken the law per se by buying the bodies, but he was accused of being deficient in principle and heart. The gravity of the crime soon became more apparent, especially after Hare turned King's evidence. That meant becoming a witness for the state so that at least one man could be convicted of the murders. Hare turned on his partner and left Burke and his wife to face the music. On Christmas Day 1828, the judge sentenced Burke to death. His final statement, the judge said these now historic lines, Your body should be publicly dissected and anatomized, and I trust that if it is ever customary to preserve skeletons, yours will be preserved, in order that posterity may keep in remembrance your atrocious crimes. Prior to his death, Burke confessed to the full extent of the crime, saying he always felt bad about what he'd done and could only sleep with the aid of alcohol and opium. He also said Hare was the one who had the murderousness in him. Nonetheless, Burke was detested and angry mobs made their feelings known, at some points chasing down the two wives who were never convicted of the murders. 25,000 people turned up on January 28, 1829 when Burke was hanged. The tickets for the subsequent public dissection by Professor Monroe sold out in seconds, and a riot ensued when some students couldn't get through the door. Today, you can actually see Burke's death mask and skeleton at the Anatomy Museum of Edinburgh Medical School. Hare was kept in custody for some time to protect him from the mob. There was a real threat of being beaten to death. His wife had been badly beaten while trying to get over to Ireland. Mr. Hare was snuck out of Edinburgh on a coach, but he was recognized on the way by another passenger. He was soon hunted down by a mob and so was taken to a local prison for protection. There, the crowd swarmed in numbers trying to knock down doors and throwing stones at the windows. The crowd was eventually dispersed by police, and in the middle of the night, Hare was taken from his cell and driven by coach in the direction of the English border. When he was close, he was told to make his own way to England. He was never seen again, or at least there are no records of sightings. As for Knox, he might have gotten away with it in the eyes of the law, but the mobs let their anger be known when they turned up at his house. He was later disbarred from the Royal College of Surgeons, although to this day he's credited with being one of the main people that advanced the study of anatomy. Still, back then the public for the most part was furious that men of science were involved with grave robbing. A bill called the Anatomy Act of 1832 was introduced which made it legal for people to donate bodies to the advancement of science. The schools also said if a donation is received, they'll foot the bill for the funeral. This put an end to the work of the resurrectionists, but it hardly impressed the public who didn't like the idea of dissection at all, nor the fact that it was usually only paupers who ended up on the slab. One activist wrote at the time, they tell us it was necessary for science. Science? Why? Who is science for? Not for poor people. Then if it's necessary for science, let them have the bodies of the rich, for whose benefit
that science is cultivated. Now, you need to watch why graves are actually dug six feet deep, or have a look at best evidence of life after death.